the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. In last week's edition of Challenge 2.0, we joined the 2,500-mile journey of this totem pole created by the Lummi Nation House of Tears Carvers. We also joined a discussion of what that journey represents and what it calls for in terms of a change of our relationship to the environment, a restoration of ancient salmon runs that sustained life in the Pacific Northwest for not just centuries, but millennia. Welcome to this edition, then, of Challenge 2.0, Spirit of the Waters, Part 2. A threat to the abundance of salmon runs in the Northwest seemed inconceivable in 1855. That was the year Washington Territory Governor Isaac Stevens completed treaty negotiations with Northwest Native Americans. Defined as contracts between sovereign nations, the treaties mandated the removal of Native peoples from their traditional lands to reservations. Those contracts also guaranteed the continued ability to hunt, fish, and gather food beyond those lands. In fact, reservation lands were far smaller than the properties given to timber companies alone. Negotiation tactics were said to be such that they would make a traveling peddler blush. New settlers to the territory cashed in on the bountiful runs of salmon. Fish traps built and owned by whites were just one pressure that led to diminishing runs. Just 40 years after the treaties were signed, Indian fishing accounted for less than 5% of what was termed the harvest. Increased logging and soil runoff from now barren slopes damaged salmon reproduction. And by 1935, the development of commercial fishing fleets claimed 90% of the catch. The share caught by Native Americans was then less than 2%. Rebuilding those salmon runs, respect for treaty rights and Native American culture, motivated the totem pole journey in May, sponsored by an intertribal nonprofit. The focus? removal of dams on the Lower Snake River. Challenge 2.0 was invited to moderate a discussion among tribal leaders. Former Lummi Nation Tribal Chair Jay Julius founded the nonprofit that sponsored the Spirit of the Waters Totem Journey. He welcomed a standing room only crowd at the university and introduced our roundtable discussion. I'm so grateful that youth are here, the young ones, Again, thank you to the elders, especially who carry the wisdom, the patience, the knowledge, uh, the, the knowledge keepers, and to the youth. So at this point, you've already met Jay Julius, uh, former chair of Money Nation, uh, Shannon Wheeler on the other end, uh, the vice chair of the Nez Perce, and in between, Joe Big uh the retired chair of the Yakima Nation. So I thank you each of you gentlemen for being a part of this. Shannon and Jody, I might ask you to expand on that idea of a covenant with salmon. Uh, it's so different from what we tend to grow up with in terms of Western culture, of human beings elevated and then everything else down low. Uh, give us some background on that. Uh, at one of the, or probably the oldest archeological site in North America, at Cooper's Ferry is 16,500 years old. And we know that we've been here. This is the land that we sprang from. And that's our relationship uh, to the land. And that's our relationship to the salmon and, and how that how we're connected. And this is this is the unwritten law. This is the law before law. So uh, we go by that and, and it's it's just like digging roots or or bulbs when we interact with that land. Today they call it when you're aerating, you're lifting the soil and you're opening it up and then you're moving the, the seeds around, you cover it back up. That's the law that we have and we've carried that on. When we have a first kill or a first catch, we have ceremony for that, there's song for that. Those are the unwritten laws that, that we must do 
in order to maintain for that land to continue to give to us. Because we're no different from the land. When we say that our blood is tied to the land and the land tied to us, that's exactly what it is. And, and our relationship is what we do to the earth is what we do to ourselves. That's the truth of what's happening on the Snake River. The sediment, we're poisoning the water, it's getting warmer, climate change is happening, it's here, it's now, it's all around us. And those are the simple truths of, of what we're facing today. And that's the unwritten laws that we have to go back to and interact to, as was mentioned, that disconnect, that divorcing from nature, that's happening. We need to get back in that relationship and understanding truly what is uh, what we're doing to the earth that the earth will do back to us. You know, one of the, <clears throat> the greatest challenges I think that we face, and I think we acknowledged it earlier, and we acknowledge it quite often, is how you can come to relate to somebody. Um, you know, one of the, you know, things that I think goes on that we've spoken about throughout the journey, but I know in other um, areas and times we've spoken about too, is are we all looking at the same picture? Are we all acknowledging and looking at the same picture? <coughs> so I'm going to do a little quick, anybody wants to participate, I want you to go ahead and do it. I want you to hold your hand out like this. I want you to close your eyes. In your hand, I want you to envision your elders, your ancestors. I want you to envision the right in front of you, all the way going back as far as you can, no matter who you are, what race you are, where you come from, go back as far as you can. Picture them in your mind. Picture them. What are they expressing to you? What are they showing you? I want you to hold that in your mind and your heart. Open your eyes. 230 years ago and eight days, as I had expressed before, there was an original free existence amongst the Nez Perce Nation, the Lummi Nation, the Yakima Nation, and all the other respective nations throughout this land and other lands. Everything that we knew about our awareness, our reality, was in and of itself. And you heard my brother Shannon, my brother Jay, give those expressions of those testimonies of that inner relationship with our surroundings at that time, such as water, such as famine, and all other beings. And through that, there, it's very essential to know and understand. We didn't just sit down and say, hey, Brother Shannon, Brother Jay, this is how we're going to form this relationship and, and try to make it respectful with water, try to make it respectful with salmon, try to make it respectful with our roots, with our berries, with all these things. Throughout time, our people's perspective, we have our origin stories, our creation stories. We too were created by Namiratla, Tamanratla, God. And God taught us to be so beautiful, so special, and so unique. He created us with ways of life and inner relationships. And he communicated that creation and brought us forth through divine communication. And that interaction of how we are to interrelate with our surroundings was communicated in divine nature. Without getting into the details, which us native people will rarely do with regard to those, the history, of how these ways of life, these unwritten laws, these things that guide us as best as we can in today's time to continue to advocate for right and respectful relationships for our surroundings. 230 years ago in eight days, life was substantially different for our peoples, our collective peoples, and the way that we interacted, and the way that we were able to observe and harvest fish, the way that we could put our hands down and drink from the water, the way that we could uh, go about our lives. And then there became the interaction with the travelers that come across the seas. Each of you carry native ways of life. My brother Jay is a strong advocate to remind each and every one of us 
at some point in time, you travel back throughout your lines, and you're gonna to come to a people who interrelated and interacted with nature, much in the same fashion or way that the native people of this land have done. There's probably some teachings, instructions, of how to carry on in a respectful way, in a right way, that resides within your elders that you're looking at in your hand. That resides there. And I think one of the greatest challenges that we face in today's time is we don't know who we are. We don't know who we are. We may think we know who we are, collectively. And there may be some of us as individuals who have had better insight and been able to conduct certain things in our lives that give us better understanding of who we are as individuals. But collectively, as a society, we are lost because we don't know where we came from. We don't know where we came from. And if you don't know who you are and you don't know where you came from, you're never going to understand where you're going. And this is what we are like collectively, all of us together. Because no matter how much I may individually disagree with some of the things I see in the practical world, one thing I have to acknowledge as much as I may disagree with it is that we're all in this together. We are all in this together. So as I look at the other questions of what is, and what isn't, and why, I ask myself, how are we to position ourselves to get to the same picture? Because that seems to be a substantial step that we need to get to that all walks of life and all representations, no matter who you are and where you come from, that we can at least acknowledge that we are looking somewhat at the same picture. And it's only at that time that we can come to a, an agreement or a disagreement or somewhere in between. Do we agree or do we disagree with what this picture looks like? Do you understand who you are? Do you understand where you come from? Do you understand where we are all going? You understand that we are robbing future generations from the opportunities that we have had. The ability to at least interact with that salmon, the ability to interact with that water, the ability to carry on in a way that acknowledges something of beauty. Because if you can get to understanding who you are in a sense of interrelating that you are of creation, that takes away all race barriers. You are of creation. And if you can understand that, you'll come to understand the beauty of what it is to be that of creation. And the beauty of what it is to sustain that and the ability to potentially fight for something in the future. You spoke very eloquently of the need to have a sense of the big picture, the big image, and even you know, that sense of memory that you possess from having lived on your lands for so many centuries that I don't know if we were to do a survey here how many people have lived in the Northwest for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We don't have that sense of deep memory. I'm wondering if you can paint a picture for us of the situation you knew in terms of the salmon, in terms of the water, in terms of that relationship between uh, people and that environment, and how far it's fallen to be where it's at and what we find it to be right now. It's definitely a difficult picture to, to look at uh, where we're at currently uh, compared to historically where uh, the Pacific Northwest was at at one time. And, and you know, many times we spoke about uh, keystone species and nutrients and and how those are derived uh, from the ocean and back to the mountains and to the mountaintops and distributed across the landscape. And that's part of Salmon's job of what they've been doing for millions of years and the interaction and how they're tied uh, together with, with the orca. And, and you can see the depletion in the numbers of how they affect not only the orca and the people uh, the salmon people, but also the landscape that's out there. And those are the, the ripple effects and the long-term effects. And, and I know hydro is a, a, a carbon-free energy, 
but it's not an environmental free energy. It burns salmon, and they burn salmon at a high rate. And, and that's not for us and, and the promises that were made to us and the, uh, what our people see and what Lewis and Clark see, what the uh, matriarch for the j that passed away uh, that was uh, over 100 years old would see at the mouth of the Columbia River the runs of the of the summer salmon of the of the June hogs these hundred pound fish those uh, those are that's the picture that was once was and the picture of today is you have way less fish uh, it's not even close to the historical number As a matter of fact it's at the quasi extinction threshold where 50 or fewer native spawning fish return to a tributary for four consecutive years and those fish are in few numbers but they're in less weight now 14 pounders 12 pounders where's the 100 pound fish where's the 50 60 pound fish that's the picture that we're seeing now and what we're experiencing and so for the landscape to be experiencing the same thing with those nutrients that we depend on too, and the landscape depends on it, the trees, the berries, the roots, and the grasses, and the ungulates, and the winged ones out there, that picture is even more grim for them when they go to look. When the pod goes down to the Columbia, mouth of the Columbia River, out of memory, just like the salmon have a memory, buffalo have memory, and that, that memory takes them to the grasses that they need to go to, the salmon follow the same path and, and return. All of that's memory. And, and as that disappears, more and more it makes it more difficult. Um, and this picture becomes a lot more distorted and leading one way towards industry. And with the experience that we have with that now, with the science and the technology that are out there, we can actually change that. And it takes prayers like what we have when you pray over the totem, when you pray to whoever you pray to, it takes that to give strength to each and every one of us and, and to be able to do the right thing out there to correct this picture and to get that balance back uh, for the salmon, for the orca, for the landscape in general that we traverse ourselves. So that's the picture that, that we're really seeing. The storyteller from the Northwest calls it home, uh, being one with. The storyteller says the creator created heaven and earth. Then created water. Then created the whale and the fish. Then the creator created. I think what's important in all creation stories, from Lummi, from Europe, from Alaska, from Hawaii, uh, humans weren't first. I think ancient storytellers talk about common sense, uh, caretaking, stewardship, ways to take care of this gift, this garden. So here in the Pacific Northwest, all we see is all we see. We see these pillars and we see these, but these are tiny in comparison to what was normal here. It took 10, 12, 14 of us men in this room right now to wrap our arms around one of our great trees. Whether you're in Quinault, on the coast, Northern California, up here. But the garden that we call home, when newcomers arrived not very long ago, in their journals it says, we got here and there was nothing. <laughs> nothing. The rivers flowed free. The newcomers could walk across the backs of salmon on the rivers and streams. The trees were so huge, it was just magical. 
It was a Eden. It was a perfect garden that provided, that produced, that fed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I think if we acknowledge what took place in the past in Europe, East Coast, and here, I think with all of us here, no matter where we come from, we're the hope. We're the hope for the children that are sitting in this room right now that they may see uh, a wild salmon one day. But the trajectory and where we're going and the path we're on right now, it, it is not going to happen. Where we're at right now, we will, if we do not change our thought process and our, 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 our ways, we, this generation and the youth generation that is here today, is going to witness the extinction of a species that belongs more so than us invasive species that have done all this destruction to this water and this land. We're going to witness that extinction. But we are in a holy war. We are in a holy war. And it's not so much that the Christians who walk in today's time understand that. 230 years ago, in eight days, Captain Gray was funded by some Boston merchants. He navigated that mouth of the Enchilada, the Columbia River. As he made it through, there was a little bit of dispute. Anyone who knows a little bit of history can probably say, well, Spain believed they were here first, or England believed they were here first. But Captain Gray, according to the written record, was the first to navigate the mouth. According to the written record, as he was doing so, there was canoes by his ship, observing, watching, observing, watching. When they made it through, they went up the river, I think it's like 12, 15 miles. All the while, canoes by, canoes are by, they're watching, they're observing. As they got up their ways, they met ashore. They spent the next the night and the morning getting unstuck from the river, the Columbia River in Shawana. They turned back around and started going back down the river. They stopped. They headed to the north shore of the Enchilada, the Columbia River, and what everybody knows and understands as Washington State today. Him and his first mate took an oar boat, a uh, rowboat, went there, they found a pine tree. Under that pine tree, he took some coins. He took those coins and he buried them at the base of that pine tree. And that was his materialization of a ceremony to assert dominion over the Enchilada, the Columbia River, and all of its tributaries, and all of the lands of such. And all of these people, such as the one in the canoes who were observing and are watching, whether or not he meant it or not, it was kind of deemed that they were heathens and infidels. And what he was doing was following suit with regard to a practice that was asserted by Spain and by England, such as Cristobal Colon as he arrived in Honduras, laid claim in the name of Spain, John Cabot as he established and laid claim on the East Coast, following suit to the, what I like to deem, unholy marching orders issued by the Roman Catholic Church in the 15th, 16th century, which said that any of these monarchies, if they came upon unclaimed lands and our waters, our lands occupied by heathens and our infidels, that they had a holy right to exert dominion. Then you have treaties. Lummi Nation, Nis First Nation, Yakima Nation, 1855. Okay, those treaties reserve rights to protect our salmon, protect the water, protect the environment. They should stand the test of time because pursuant to Article 6, Clause 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which is the highest law of the United States, all right, they need to be adhered to. So how is it that the treaties were overcome in 1947 when the Harbors Act was passed by Congress, which materialized the eventual manifestation of the Snake River Dams? That was the violation of the Nez Perce Treaty. I would argue it was a violation of the Yakima Treaty and the Lummi Treaty. But it's important that people understand this history and how it's relevant to Shen and his people's fight right now because it's holding precedent right now as we speak.
I would have all of us think back to what Shannon was talking about with the original offer of the salmon to be a source of nourishment for all of us and that they were giving up their voice and that that voice would now be ours. Uh, we have had the privilege of hearing three very eloquent voices up here, exemplified by their lives, but those voices, those stories need to be multiplied. And look at the crowd up here, look at the people sitting next to you behind you, literally out the door. <laughs> carry these stories, carry this memory of tonight, and carry it forward so that we don't have to continue to talk about why haven't we accomplished what needs to be accomplished. Uh, thank you very much. And one thing? Sure. Put your hands out. Close your eyes. I want you to envision as far as you can see down your line into the future. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, as far as you can imagine, as far as you can imagine, I want you to envision that. And I want you to take ownership as to how you can contribute as to what that picture looks like. What do they say to you? What are you feeling from them? What do you wish and want for them? Open your eyes. Okay, thank you. Next week, part three of Challenge 2.0, Spirit of the Waters.